Well, please do take out your message outline. And uh, as you know, uh, we're in this series called It's Not About Me. And uh, it's going to be a six-week series now. As I was uh, saying to you a couple of weeks ago, I made my mind up how long this was going to run. Well, it's six weeks now because I've already written it. Um, but uh, we're, we're thinking about how do we uh, live for God and how do we love others? That's really what we're doing. How do we put God first in our lives? And then how do we love others before ourselves? It's not about me, basically. That's the whole idea. And we began the first uh, part in this series by thinking about how we can get the focus off of ourselves and realizing that if we're a Christian, we are saved, not for our own benefit. We're saved for his name's sake. We are saved for the glory of God. Last week, we talked about what true greatness is, not the type of greatness that the world wants us to believe in, but actually, true greatness is having a spirit of humility. Now, this morning, I want us to think a little bit more now about um, how, how love acts towards other people. Because we're thinking about how we live for God, but how do we love others? What does that look like? Because life, you see, is all about learning to love. And one of the ways that God builds love into our life is he tests it. So what he does is he puts you around unlovely people. I mean, it's easy to love loving people, isn't it? It's easy to love people that you get on well with. It's easy to love people that you really like. But for God to teach you real love, he's going to put you around some unlovely people, people that really get up your nose. So 1 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us actually four ways that love deals with unlovely people. Notice, and I've underlined the four ways, love is not rude, that's the first way. Love does not demand its own way, that's the second way. Love is not irritable, third way. And love keeps no record of when it has been wronged. So when you understand these four uh, areas of love and you begin to build them into your life, you graduate from, say, the diploma level of love to, to, the, to the sort of master's degree level of love. In fact, if you wanted to sum this verse up, it basically it means that you treat people respectfully. 1 Peter 2, 17 says, show respect for everyone you love, show respect for everyone and love your Christian brothers and sisters. Well, how do you do that? How do you love everyone? That's what this verse is saying. It's covering all the bases. How do you do that? How, how do you love the different types of people that you have in your life day in, day out? Well, let me give you four ways that we can do that this morning. Here is the first one here on your outline. First of all, the Bible says love is not rude, so therefore I must be tactful, not just truthful. That's the first thing. So in each of our lives, we have difficult people, don't we? You know who they are. If you don't know who they are, you might be that difficult person. But um, they're people who are just hard to work with, aren't they? You know, they're, they're hard to get along with. They seem unpleasable. They're always cranky. Uh, they can be irresponsible. They, they can be immature. They may be a little bit deficient in social skills, perhaps. I don't know. Um, but one of the primary characteristics of these difficult types of people is that they are rude. They can be really obnoxious, can't they? Do you find that? It's hard to love really obnoxious people, isn't it? Have you noticed there are a lot of them around today? Have you found that? They're everywhere, aren't you? And have you noticed that the world is becoming increasingly rude, isn't it? Uh, There's rudeness everywhere, at school, at work, maybe at home, in restaurants, in shops, certainly on the motorway these days, isn't it? It's all there everywhere. So I want to ask you to participate in a little survey with me this morning. Uh, If I were to ask you to what form of rudeness really irritates you the most? What type of rudeness really gets up your nose? What would that be? And then what I want you to do is, in, for the next five seconds, I want you to share that with the person sitting next to you. Now, in a minute, I'm going to give you my top ten list, okay? But uh, I've got ten, but you're only allowed one this morning, all right? Um, but, you know, what's the thing that really gets up your nose? The thing that really bugs you, you know? So I want you to turn to someone and say that. Now, don't say what really bugs me is pastors who ask me to participate in a survey with strangers that I don't want to talk to. Don't say that. That's not on the list, okay? But one thing that really gets... Right, so turn to the person. Five seconds, okay? What one thing really makes, gets up your nose, rudeness-wise? Right, just one. Don't give them a whole list, okay? And don't say you when you're talking to that person, okay? All right? Right, here's my top ten list. Ready? See how many of these resonate with you. Here we go. All right? Uh, There probably could be more. Uh, I could probably go tell this evening if you really want me to, but I won't. Here is my top ten things that bug me, that are rude. Number one, uh, number ten, I'll go go backwards, okay? Number ten, sales calls. 
That's annoying, isn't it? They always ring when you're about to eat a meal or you're busy. Sales calls. Get up my nose. Number nine, people who slurp their soup. I don't know why that annoys me, <laughs> but, you know, soup should be seen and not heard, frankly, I think. Number eight, people who honk their horn in traffic jams when they're going absolutely nowhere. I mean, what's the point? You're not going anywhere, are you? What, what, what a waste of energy. Number seven, people who play loud music in their car. You know, if I wanted to listen to their rap music, then frankly, I'd buy the CD. They do not need to share it with me. Number six, people who light cigarettes and hold it near you instead of smoking it away from you. Isn't that annoying? People smoke in your face. And by the way, they're not really smokers. It's a cigarette that smokes. They're just the suckers, basically. Um, <laughs> number five, okay, now I'm ramping it up now. Number five, okay, this one really gets up my nerves. Okay, Ooh, I've got to breathe a little bit, okay. People who cheat at the 10 item or less checkout. Oh, <laughs> you know, if you go there, you're, do you count? I count. I go, 12, 12. So that annoys me. Okay, uh, number four. <laughs> this is very cathartic for me. I'm having a great time this morning. Number four, people who sent me junk mail, you know, all that sort of stuff. Don't want that. Okay. Um, number three, people who leave church early during the last song. Number two, same as number three, people who leave early during the church during the last song, or go for a little, can I say this? Go for a little wander while I'm speaking and preaching. Just not looking at anybody, just look up like that, sort of thing, you know? Just want to say, work in here, okay? I know my job, your job is to listen. Anyway, number one, okay, here is my top one, okay? Number one, people who come from the opposite direction and steal the parking space you've been patiently waiting for. <laughs> Oh, that's really annoying, isn't it? You ever had that happen? Okay, so that's my top ten list, okay? I, I could go on longer if you wanted to. But, you know, the question is, is then, how do you respond to these types of people? How, how, do, you, how do you respond in love to difficult people? Well, love is tactful. That's what this verse is telling us. In other words, you don't return their rudeness. You, come, you overcome evil with good. You don't respond in kind. So when people are difficult, you don't be difficult back. And one of the ways that you can be tactful is simply by listening to them, first of all. They may have a point. Because if you listen to people sympathetically and then you respond tactfully, that is a love and response to a difficult person. You listen lovingly and then you respond lovingly. Now, the thing about listening really goes with tact because one of the things that I think is uh, another area of rudeness in our society today, and let me tell you, we're all guilty of it. I'm definitely guilty of it. You are guilty of it as well and that is interrupting people. Do you do that? Interrupt people? Not listening. Because it's rude not to listen to the person you're talking to, isn't it? It's rude to not let somebody finish their sentence. I do this. My brain runs really fast, and I think I know what per the person is going to say before they get to it, so I interrupt them. That's rude. Look what the Bible says about this. And the Bible does say something about this. Proverbs 8, verse 13. Answering before listening is both stupid and rude. That's a great verse, isn't it, there in the message? This concludes the sermon. Go do likewise. I mean, really, that's all we need now, isn't it? No, it's not. There's more I've got to tell you. But we all do this, don't we? We are rude because we jump to conclusions. We assume we know what other people are going uh, to say. We think we know what they think. No, no, no. Tact is listening. Love listens. And then love responds tactfully, not just truthfully. See, people with tact have well, have less to retract, don't they, when they say silly things. Look what Ephesians 4, verses 31 to 32 says. Stop being bitter and angry and mad at each other. Don't yell at one another or curse each other or, either, or ever be rude. Instead, be kind and merciful and forgiving. Forgive others, just as God forgave you because of Christ. You see, love listens. Love is tactful. Uh, and notice it says don't yell at each other, don't curse at each other. Uh, and by the way, things like profanity, it just, it, it requires zero intelligence, doesn't it? I mean, just bad language requires no IQ. You know, you can teach a parrot to swear, can't you? Profanity is no sign of intelligence. In fact, actually, it's a sign that you, that you can't think of a better word at that point. And, and by the way, some people think that they're being, um, they're being frank when they talk to you, but actually they're just being rude. You know, people who say, well, I just speak my mind. I just tell it as it is, I don't mess about, and I'm proud of that. Well, actually, telling it as it is is not the best way to communicate. 
telling it like it could be, telling it like it should be, telling it like it might be, telling it like it could be with hope, well, that actually builds people up, doesn't it? A lot of times, frankness is just rudeness. You need to ask yourself, when you, if you, this is a danger for you, you need to ask yourself, why am I saying it this way? Am I saying this because I just want to let off steam? I just want to vent at that person? Or am I saying it really for the benefit of the other person? What I'm saying, is that really going to help them? Look at Proverbs 16, verse 21. A wise, mature person is known for his understanding. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. Just do that on your outline. Circle in that verse the word pleasant and circle the word persuasive and then draw a line between them. Because that's a really important connection because the more pleasant you are, the more persuasive you are. In fact, you might want to write this under this verse. It's a bit of a, a, a rhyming thing, but you might want to write this. It's not going to be on the screen. You want to write this, I'm never persuasive when I'm abrasive. It's true, isn't it? I'm never persuasive when I'm abrasive. Because when I'm abrasive with anybody, I'm never persuasive. Because nagging doesn't work, does it? Does it work on you? Doesn't work on me? No. I'm never persuasive when I'm abrasive. You don't get your point across by being cross. So the way you say something determines the way that it is received. If you say it offensively, it's going to be received defensively. That's why love is about your words. It's being truthful. Yes, you're not lying about it, but you're saying it tactfully. Sometimes when we say something that is truthful, we just sometimes say it in totally the wrong way. Tact and tone go together. It's the way you say it. It's the tone of your voice. You can say something very difficult to someone, but if you say it in the right tone, and if you say it with love, if you say it tactfully, it will be received so much more better. The Bible says love is not rude. It means you're tactful, not just truthful. Secondly, the Bible says love does not demand its own way, so therefore I must be understanding, not demanding. I must be understanding, not demanding. Now, the second part of this verse here in 1 Corinthians uh, talks about how we deal with demanding people. And again, we have demanding people in our lives, and I guess we know who they are. They are the type of people that have an agenda, that they are aggressive, they are pushy, they tend to be demanding uh, around you, and you tend to feel sort of a little bit manipulated, that they can be stubborn. They tend to think that they're always right. And they can be very self-centered, because actually at this point, they're not actually thinking about anybody else apart from themselves. These are the people who always want their own way. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's, there's always got to be a right and a wrong way to do it, and your way is always the wrong way, because they're always right, no matter what. And you can never quite please them. They've got their own standards, and if you don't meet your, their standards, well, they'll let everybody know that you haven't done that. Well, how do you respond in love to these demanding type of people? Well, Jesus is the best example of this, because Paul tells us in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 7, that your attitude should be the same, that, same of that of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ had. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. He was God, yes, but he was understanding, not demanding. Circle those words. Notice it says, did not demand and cling to his rights. Well, we live in a society, don't we, where everybody says, I have my rights. Because they're being demanding, not understanding. And one of the greatest tests of your character is how you treat people who serve you. You know, the sort of people, you know, the waiters, the waitresses, maybe the people at the fast food places, maybe the person who delivers your post, um, you know, maybe the, the people who serve you, who, people who you work with. How, how do you treat the people who help you out? Do you even notice them? When's the last time maybe you thank the, the bin men for dealing with your bins? You know, it, how, how, do, how do we respect people who serve us? So I wonder, let me give you a bit of homework for this week. I want you to practice being understanding, not demanding. So maybe if you're out to lunch this week, or, or, or maybe you go to the supermarket uh, and someone is serving you, don't be demanding, but be understanding. Realise that that person who is serving you may be having a really bad day that day. And actually you just to say a word of encouragement, uh, 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 just a, a loving word, just a simple thank you could change their whole outlook that day. Now, you know the best place to practice it? How about at home? Do you find this? Sometimes we're more polite to strangers than we are to people that we love in our lives. Have you found that? 
Now, I don't know if it bothers you, but it does bother me because sometimes, I have to say, to confess this, sometimes I say the meanest things, sometimes the most unthoughtful things to the people that I love the most. And that bothers me. I, I could be nice to strangers, but not nice in the same capacity to the people who are around me all the time. So Titus 3, 2 says, Believers shouldn't curse anyone or be quarrelsome, but they should be gentle and show courtesy to everyone. Just circle the word courtesy in that verse, because that's really important. Courtesy. What is courtesy? Well, I think courtesy is a number of things, but one of the things is showing love in little things. That's what it is. And I found over the years in partial ministry, a lot of marriages die just from a lack of courtesy. Because the things you used to do for each other, you don't do anymore. The little niceties, the, the thoughtful things, the notes, the cards, the flowers, the calls, the courtesies, opening the door, the let me get that for you, not get it yourself type of thing. You know, a lot of marriages are buried from a lot of little digs. Just a lack of courtesy. How do you then be more understanding of the people who are demanding in your life? Well, the Bible tells us that patience comes from perspective. Because the more you understand about a person, the more patient you are going to be with them. That the more, so, so often we are impatient with people because we don't understand them. But, but when I know them, when I know them well, then I, I, I'm going to know the three B's. Jot these down. There are three B's that you need to know, and it's not going to be on the screen. This is an extra for you. Three B's about helping understand people, okay? Understand their background, their battles, and their burdens. That's what you should have in your mind every time you're dealing with someone. Their background, their battles, and their burdens. So before you get sharp and short with anybody, you need to say, do I know their background? Do I know the battles that they are going through at the moment? do I know of any burdens that they are carrying? Because that's going to make you a lot more courteous, a lot more patient with these people. Because we often look at people and we go, look how far they have to go. But we don't stop and say, I wonder how far they've come. Maybe they were raised in a family where they have no model of kindness, no model of courtesy. Maybe they grew up in a very dysfunctional home and they've gotten this far. And they need to be applauded for that. We always look how far they've got to go. We don't look at how far they've come. So look at their background. Look at the battles that maybe they are facing. Look at the burdens that they are carrying. What are the problems that they have? There are all kinds of battles and burdens that people are carrying that, that you and I very often don't know about. And we go crashing in, and we're not understanding. Instead, we become demanding. Proverbs 19.11 says this, a man's wisdom, that means having this type of perspective, gives him patience. Remember, patience comes from perspective. It is to his glory to overlook an offence. Now, here's the question. I wonder, do you overlook offences or are you offended by them? Are you offended by offences? Are you so touchy and irritable that anybody who looks at you in the wrong way or, or forgets to say something to you or, or, or walks past you and didn't see you, you get really offended by that? Well, the Bible says here it is a glory to a man or woman's character to overlook an offence. Love lets it go. This is the golden rule, by the way, in Luke 6, verse 31. <coughs> do to others as you would have them do to you. That's what we're talking about, really, in a nutshell this morning. In being understanding, not demanding, do to others what you would have them do to you. Now, does that then mean, if I do this, does that then mean that I'm just supposed to let demanding people run all over me? No. Do I just let them push me around? Do I act like a doormat and, and always cave in and say whatever they want? No, no, no. Here's the key. Be tender without surrender. Don't let people just push you around. Jesus never caved into manipulators. The religious leaders, the, the Pharisees, always tried to manipulate Jesus. They were always extremely demanding. They were very legalistic. They had all kinds of demands that they, even themselves they couldn't keep. Jesus would not let other demanding people push him into a corner but he was tender without surrendering that's what you call love in action third thing third thing the bible says or that verse says is love is not irritable so because of that therefore i must be gentle not judgmental i must be gentle not judgmental now here's my third group of people that we need to deal with that is disappointing people 
These people don't always mean to hurt you, and sometimes they may be very well-intentioned, but they will disappoint you. They just let you down. They break promises that they say that they'll keep, or they foul you in some way. It could be more serious than that. Disappointing people could be unfaithful to you. They could be disloyal to you. They could, uh, because you see, the reality is, is that you will be disappointed in life. In fact, everybody in your life is going to disappoint you. Your friends are going to disappoint you. Your family, your parents, they're going to disappoint you. Your husband or your wife is going to disappoint you. I'm going to disappoint you as your pastor. Why? Because nobody is perfect. So because of that, how then does love respond when we're disappointed by other people? How can we be gentle and not judgmental? Well, look what Paul says in Galatians 6 verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone in your group does something wrong, you who are spiritual should go to that person and notice and gently help him, gently help make him right again. But be careful because you might be tempted to sin too. You might want to circle that word gently in that verse. <clears throat> How do you have tough conversations with people? How do you confront people that you love when you see they are doing something they shouldn't be doing? Well, the Bible, the Bible says that you are and you should do this gently, not harshly, not in a rude or in a mean way, but you do it with gentleness and you do it with respect. So here's a little question for us all. Right plus rude equals wrong every single time. You might be right, but if you're rude, you are wrong. It doesn't matter if you're right, because if you're rude about it, nobody's going to care what you have to say anyway, are they? They're immediately going to be get get defensive. So you do it in a gentle and a loving way, not a harsh or cruel way. So Colossians 3 verse 13 says, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Notice what it says. It says here, whatever grievances. You, you can't be selective about this. No, no, no. He says, forgive whatever grievances you have against one another and forgive as the Lord forgave you. And then in Romans 14, 12, the Bible says this, each of us will give an account of himself to God, so you're not going to give an account to each other. Therefore, let's stop passing judgment on each other. So it's really important that we understand the difference between using your judgment and being judgmental. You've got to use your judgment so that you can see that something's going wrong. There's nothing wrong with doing that. You've got to decide between right and wrong. We're giving judgment on that to be able to know what the truth is. But the truth is not judgmental. It's only judgmental when you beat somebody over the head with it. That's when it becomes judgmental. So Proverbs 15.4 says, Gentle words bring life and health. A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. And I love the way the message paraphrase puts it like this. Kind words heal and help, but cutting words wound and maim. And we know that, don't we? We've been in the end of that before that we've had someone say something really harsh to us and they really hurt. Words hurt, cut, wound and maim. We always have a choice when we speak to somebody uh, because you can either build them up or you can hurt them with your words. And do you know, your words can hurt someone for years. But the Bible says that kind words are words that will heal and help. Speak words of life and health and hope into them, not words of judgment and harshness. Be gentle. And it's the same in our marriages. How many marriage problems could be avoided if we have just waited a second, just used words that were gentle and kind and words that weren't harsh or vindictive? Because I think there are really so few things that are worth fighting about. Even the things that we think are worth fighting about, most of them really aren't. They're just temporal, they're going to pass. We ought to learn to cut each other some slack and be kind and gentle in our relationships. And then there's another verse that I just threw in for a moment. This is a bonus verse for you. If you're having problems at work with your boss, look at Ecclesiastes 10 verse 4. If your boss is angry with you, don't quit. A quiet spirit can overcome even great mistakes. What this is saying is this. If you mess up at work, just admit it. Don't blame it on anybody else. Don't get all defensive and just start yelling back. Just be quiet about it. Do your job. Do it well. Do it for the glory of God because you're more likely to find mercy if you're humble about it than if you're grumpy about it. So love isn't rude and it's not demanding and it's not judgmental. Fourthly, the Bible says love keeps no record of wrongs, so therefore I don't repeat it, I delete it. <clears throat> I don't repeat it, I delete it. Now, here's the fourth aspect, which has to do with dealing with the fourth group of people, which is destructive people. 
And these are the hardest one of all. How do you love people who intentionally hurt you? Who are mean to you, who are hateful, who are manipulative? Because, you see, when people hurt us, we have two natural tendencies. We remember it, and then we retaliate. First, we remember it. We stockpile it in our mind. We put it in the back, in that database, and we say, I'm never going to forget that one. I'm never letting them off the hook with that. And then we remember it. And we rehearse it over and over and over. And the second thing we do is we, we retaliate. We want to get even. But that's not what the Bible says. No, love takes a step up. I don't repeat it. I delete it. I wipe it out of the memory bank. I let it go. I forgive it and I get on with life. Now, what do I mean by don't repeat it? Well, typically when we hurt, we actually repeat it in three ways. Follow with me here. First of all, we repeat it emotionally in our minds. That's the first thing that we do. We repeat it by going over and over and over again in our mind. And resentment will never help you. It only hurts you. Resentment, you see, is very self-destructive. It will destroy you. Because when you hold on to a grudge, when you hold on to a hurt, when you hold on to a bitterness, you're not hurting the person from the past. You're only hurting yourself. In fact, if you are allowing them to continue to hurt you in the present, um, that's just stupidity. Your past is past. It's over. It can't hurt you unless you choose to allow it to hurt you. And the way you allow it to hurt you is to remember it over and over again. And every time you remember it and you rehearse it, you go over it again and again in your mind and you just get hurt all over again. It's just not smart, is it? Resentment only keeps pain alive. It never heals, it never solves anything and we repeat it over and over again in our mind. So what should I do? Well, don't rehearse it in your mind. That's what we should do. Don't rehearse it over in your mind. Leviticus 19.17 says, Do not bear a grudge against others, but settle your differences with them so they will not commit a sin because of them. Now, how is that possible? How do I commit a sin because of them if I keep a grudge? Well, study after study has proven that whatever you rehearse, you begin to resemble. Whatever you think about most, that's what you move towards. So if you think about how much you've been hurt in your past, well, you're just moving to your past. If you focus on the future, if you move towards the future, if you focus on the promises of God, you you then are moving towards who God is. But if you focus on your pain, you're moving towards your pain. Whatever you rehearse, you will eventually begin to resemble. And you're only hurting yourself because you're repeating it over and over again in your mind. Now, the second way we repeat it is relationally as a weapon. In other words, we repeat it in fights in relationships. And some of us are really good at this. We use it as a weapon. You did this. Yeah, but you did that. Yeah, remember when you did this? Yeah, but you did that. And we just pile it up again and again and again. And it just becomes like a weapons of mass destruction, doesn't it? So what should I do? Don't repeat it over and over in arguments. Don't repeat it. Proverbs 17 verse 9 says, love forgets mistakes. In other words, you don't keep bringing it up. You don't keep a record of things that you keep bringing up and using as a weapon. Nagging about them parts the best of friends. It's true, isn't it? It Parts marriages and everything else, by the way. Nagging doesn't work. Bringing up the past is not the way to better your marriage or any other relationship for that matter because love keeps no record of wrongs. And then thirdly, we repeat it verbally in telling others. We repeat it to other people. We talk to others. Now that's called gossip. We tell everybody else. We don't talk to God about it. We don't talk to the other person. We talk to everybody else about the pain. We want to try and line up people on our side so that we can prove that we are better than them, they're bad, and they're hated as much by other people as they're hated by us. So what should I do? Don't share rumours with other people. In other words, don't gossip. Gossip is really destructive. Look at Proverbs 16, 28. It says, gossip is spread by wicked people. Did you know that? They stir up trouble and break up friendships. Did you know that every time you share a gossip, you are wicked? Do you know that God hates gossip? He hates it as much as he hates pride, because that's what gossip is. Gossip is pure ego. 
It is raw, unadulterated ego. And the only reason people gossip is to make themselves feel superior to everybody else. I know something about somebody else that makes them look bad, so I think it makes me look better. I have some secret, I know some secret here, and that gives me a sense of control. It's unadulterated ego. And every time you share a gossip, you're being prideful at that point. And we're pretty good at that. We might even do it like this. Oh, let me tell you this as a matter of prayer. Rubbish. It's gossip. You are gossiping. And God hates pride and he hates gossip. So when somebody starts gossiping, you need to say, sorry, don't want to know about that. Don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to hear about that. You don't repeat it, you delete it. And one of the greatest tests of your love is how much you gossip. Because unloving people love to gossip. Because when you're hurt, you talk to everybody else, don't you? Except the person who hurt you. You don't talk to other people, you don't talk to God. No, you deal with it. You talk to God first and get it straight in your mind, and then you talk to that person who hurt you. Mark eleven twenty six 26 says this, Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop. Leave it, let it go in order that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive you and your own failings and shortcomings and let them drop. And maybe you're sitting here this morning going, Do you know what, Phil, but it's been so long. I've carried this hurt for years. I've carried it for decades. It's just too late to do anything about it. Well, you're wrong, because look at Proverbs 10, verse 12. It says this, hate stirs up trouble. So if you have trouble in your life, if you want to keep it in your life, well, just keep hate in your life. But love forgives all offences. Now, which of the all have you not let go of? Which of the offences in your life are you still holding on to? How does God expect me to love the destructive people who've hurt me? Well, he doesn't expect you to ignore it and to pretend it doesn't exist. He's not asking you to gloss over it or to deny it it happened or to repress it or even to make excuses for the people that have hurt you in your life. In fact, God doesn't want you to fake it. He actually wants you to face it front on because you can't forgive it until you face it and you'll never be free and you'll never forgive until you face it. You've got to stop running and you've got to stop blaming and then you can deal with it. See, if you're, going to be the, if you're going to become the loving person that God wants you to be, and that, if you, and that, in fact, you want to be, and I want you to be, you're going to have to deal with some of these past issues. And they're hard, and they're hurtful, and they're difficult to deal with. But if you're still angry at anybody, you're still allowing them to control you, and just don't. As your pastor who loves you, I'm just saying, don't, don't do that. Don't allow that to happen. You've got to deal with the anger. You've got to face it before you can forgive it. Proverbs 19.11 says, when someone wrongs you, it is a great virtue to ignore it. In other words, let it go. Don't condone it. Don't say it's all okay and just sort of paper over the cracks. No, no, you, you, you let it go. You face it, yes, and then you forgive it. And then you can ignore it because love lets it go. What does love do? Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Now, I don't know let me get practical now. I don't know how this has impacted you today. This is a tough message. This is one of those rubber hits the road Christianity messages, isn't it? It's a message that we all need to hear, preacher included, and it's a message that we all need to do something about, don't we? Now, I don't know who you maybe need to forgive today. Maybe I've opened up a wound this morning, not intentionally, but maybe I've opened up a wound for you where there's someone that has really hurt you and you've never dealt with that. You've never forgiven that person. So let's face that. Because as I close, I want you to think about the person or the, uh, who has hurt you and you've not let them off the hook. You're still, it's still gnawing away, it's still dwelling there, it's still chipping away at you. And you try to bury it with lots of different sorts of things, but it keeps coming back. Well, if we really want to be like God, if we really want to be like Christ, with that sacrificial sense of love, and love forgives. Do they deserve it? No. But then you and I don't deserve be, being forgiven by God either, do we? No, we forgive because God models that. That's what grace is all about. And it's the right thing to do. And in fact, it's the only thing to do to be free from these sorts of things. So I want us to pray. Let's bow our heads. And I want us to lead, in, lead us in prayer and just be quiet for a moment. And it's an opportunity for you to just stop and to think about 
what you need to do about this. In these four different areas that I've been talking about this morning, these four types of people that we have in our lives that can be this really damaging to us, how, how will you respond in love as we've looked at this morning? Father, I don't know all the hurts that people are going through here today, but I know that you know every one of them and you want them to be freed from it. Maybe you might just need to bring <coughs> someone before the Lord or a past situation that's never been dealt with or a painful situation, a hurtful situation that you're facing even right now and you're in the midst of that. pray on your behalf and you might want to just echo these words a little bit. Lord, I'm tired of the pain. I'm tired of being stuck in the prison of the past. I'm tired of wasting emotional energy on the people who've hurt me. Please fill me with the spirit of forgiveness, with the spirit of love. And Lord, please take over every area of my life. I invite you into every crevice and corner of my heart. I ask you to forgive all my sins, all the ways I've hurt other people when I was demanding, not understanding. When I was judgmental, not gentle. When I was repeating the sins instead of deleting the sins. Lord, forgive me for all of that. And I also want to let go of the people who have hurt me in my life. I want you to fill my life with love. I want to be able to love others. And so today in faith, I'm letting them go. I'm letting them off the hook. I am forgiving them. Father, help me to be tactful, not just truthful. Help me to be gentle, not judgmental. Help me to be understanding, not demanding. And when people hurt me, Help me to not repeat it, but to delete it. Because, Father God, I want to become a more loving person. And I can't do this in my own strength. I know I will fail. I failed in the past. So, Lord, I ask that you would help me, that you would give me strength, that you would help me, and that you would give me your grace. In your name I pray. Amen.